So thanks very much, Carol. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so as Carol said, there was a paper that was distributed, and anyone who's read the paper, if you have questions, uh, technical or otherwise, about the paper, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm not going to presuppose in the talk that people have read the paper, because I know some people have not. Uh, so as Carol said, this is an outgrowth of my early work. I, I, the, my dissertation was about how you could distribute income equally in a market economy and still have it work efficiently. Then I went off working on immigration for many years, and now I'm returning to that problem. And when I broached that topic originally, my sense was that the, the problem on the left, uh, so this was kind of, you know, I was a product of the late 60s, early 70s, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for uh, socialist models in places like Cuba, which I think in many ways was, to, was warranted then and is still warranted. But, but, uh, but people assumed then that if you uh, wanted uh, equality and socialism, you had to get rid of the market. And, uh, and then you have the, the, you know, the Reagan-Thatcher period and Thatcher's famous slogan, there is no alternative to capitalism, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and so on. And it, you know, I guess broadly speaking, it seems to me that on the left, one of the problems in the last decades has been this absence of a vision of an alternative future. Uh, that w what is it we're going to put in place after the revolution? Robert Dahl once had a book called After the Revolution. So, so the question is, and and at least with philosophers, and, and, and with certain kinds of political theorists as well, there's a certain, um, as I was saying in the opening to the paper, some people are content with critique. They're showing what's wrong with what is. And that's often very valuable, and the critiques are, are warranted. But for me, I've never been satisfied with a, a critique that didn't also tell you what you were going to put in its place. What's the alternative? OK, that's bad. But you have to be confident that what, you, what comes after is not going to be worse that you've got something better in mind. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not suggesting a blueprint that you're going to construct, that you've got all the details. But you have to have some story, and in particular around institutions. So in the paper, I set this up as a contrast between the way Jerry Cohen thinks about things and the way John Rawls thinks about things. So I'm with Cohen in being more egalitarian. But I think what Rawls is good at is paying attention to the questions of what are the institutions that follow from these abstract principles, and how do they transform the principles? How do they realize them, and what how, how does that work out? And that's kind of what I'm concerned with. And my initial, the, the book that Carol referred to in my dissertation, was a, had a, assumed a kind of a, a single society and had a model about how you distribute income in a, in a single society, assuming, as Rawls does in his work, for example, a closed system. But I've been writing about immigration for 30 years, and so I, I can't assume a closed system anymore. And I don't think anybody should, right, in the context of globalization. So the question is no longer what would a just society look like. The question is what would a just world look like. And that's what I'm trying to do in my next project, is think about what, what would a just world look like. I'm, I'm teaching a course to first-year students on utopias and dystopias. And what's striking to me is they've all read dystopias. They all have a picture of what's wrong with this and that, all the problems. They, they haven't read any utopias. They don't have any picture. So that's, I think we ought to construct a picture. And, you know, we have visions. And I, so I'm not saying this is the only one. I'm not trying to persuade everyone to adopt this one. I want to throw that out there and have people say, well, I don't like this about it, or I don't like that. Have a con start a conversation about what kind of world we want to live in, children and grandchildren, you know, what would, what would count as a just world. So what I think would count as a just world is one in which income is distributed equally. That's, I, I'm an economic egalitarian in that respect, and, and uh, so that's not just equal income, but also be collective expenditures on a wide variety of social goods. But that's a, I'm happy to argue about that if you want, uh, and I'll say a few things about why I, why I think that's the case. But that's sort of what I'm after, and I want to think about, well, what would be required institutionally to achieve that? And I still think that was what motivated my initial book. I still think that you're not going to get, you can't imagine the coordination of vast numbers of people across the world without relying on a price system and market mechanisms. So the challenge is how can you combine that commitment to economic equality, in terms of what people have to spend on their own lives, with the coordination that relies on a price system in which there are differential prices, including differential prices for labor. So that's the sort of, that's the, that's the project. It's, it was the project of my initial book, and it's the project of this paper, and it's at least one important part. There are some qualifications to it. We can talk about that uh, in, in the larger thing. But, but here I just want to kind of provoke you into thinking about that you can actually combine things 
that you probably think you can't divide. So, so take, take first the normative claim. Why would you think that, that uh, distributing income equally would be desirable? And the basic picture here is even in a society and in the larger world, we are going to have to have productive activities. And that's going to require most people to work for much of their lives. And that's a norm that everybody kind of grows up with and accepts. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actually, if you think about it, a transformation of the social world from the, say, 17th and 18th century. You read uh, Jane Austen and the gentleman does not work, right? But, but today, that's not true. Even the rich work, and they actually work hard, right? But they, they have these vast sums of money. So the norm that you should have a job and contribute to society, and th think also about the transformation of gender roles, right? So that 50 years ago, the expectation was that at least middle class, of course, working class women did work, but, but there was a kind of aspiration to a world in which women stayed home to care of the kids, and, and the men went out and earned a earned living. And that gender construction has been largely, not dismantled in practice, but largely dismantled, well, dismantled in practice in the sense that now most women, in fact, do work, even if they have kids at home. Uh, and, of course, the gender norms haven't changed about child care, but that's another component of that. Okay, so, so you, we can imagine a social world in which most people are expected to work. That's a kind of norm, and that's the, actually the world that we live in. So the question is, well, what, what should they receive as compensation for that work? Or do they need to be compensated at all? So I'm trying to suggest it's reasonable to expect people to go out and find a job in which they will contribute and they will contribute according to their capacities. They'll, they'll look for a job where whatever talents and skills they have will be put to good use, uh, so, long as, uh, so long as that's not terribly burdensome. You could imagine a situation in which somebody's very good at something but hates doing it. So I'm not saying they should do that. But in general, and the, the idea that lies behind this is that there are, for many people, not everybody, some ways in which you can contribute more to society by doing some things than other things, right? You can, uh, if you have the capacity to be a brain surgeon, that's going to do more than being a gardener. This is, this is an example actually drawn from Jerry Cohen. Uh, so, so if you've got those capacities and you kind of like them more or less equally or you don't hate being a brain surgeon, it's appropriate to expect you to be a brain surgeon, right? Because that's where you can contribute more. If you hate it, you don't have to do it, but otherwise. And, and, and you can think of all kinds of different activities uh, you know, so if you have the capacity to get a university education, maybe everybody should get a university education, but then you can have layers and levels. If you have these capacities to develop your talents and skills in particular ways, uh, in ways that aren't, that not everybody shares, that are unusual and scarce, then you should develop them in those ways that will contribute more rather than less, just broadly speaking. We can leave open for the moment the question of what counts as more and what counts as less, the idea here is that we all have choices to face about how we use our talents and skills. So everybody's got to have a job. We have choices to make about it. Now, in the world, part of what you respond to is what you enjoy doing. That's perfectly appropriate. Part of what you respond to is where can you make the most money. So I want to change that where can you make the most money to where can you contribute the most. Okay, that's the, that's the kind of general picture. And, and you can see that the normative justification for that lies in part with the idea that that's not so far removed from what we have today. What I want to what I want to challenge and remove is the assumption that because you have scarce talents and skills that can, that contribute more, we can maybe agree that some are contributing more than others, that that entitles you to more income. So Edward Bellamy has a wonderful uh, line in his in his novel Looking Backwards, in which he says that, that he's talking to somebody. This is a picture of somebody. And the, looking backward from the year 2000 to the, the uh, he wrote this in the late 19th century, and in his uh, idyllic society, people get equal incomes, of more or less on the model that I'm talking about. And, uh, and the guy from the 19th century says, well, how can that be fair? You know, if you've contributed more, don't you deserve more? It's a kind of common intuition that people have. You, you've produced more, you, you deserve more. And Bellamy says, gee, that's funny. You know, we think that if a horse didn't pull more than a goat, you know, he's not doing his job. The horse is twice as strong as the goat. Why do you expect him to pull more? So, funny how things change. You know, what, why would you think if you've got the capacity to, you know, uh, a small kid carries a bucket of water and an adult can carry two buckets? You know, the, should the adult deserve more than the 
kidney. You know, in other words, contributing according to your capacity is a perfectly reasonable, sensible norm that at some level we take for granted, and we should challenge this idea that somehow a fact you've contributed more entitles you to more. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of normative background presupposition, and then the question is, well, how would you institutionalize this arrangement, and and especially how that might sound nice as an abstract ideal, but how would you possibly combine this with the market? So two things here. I, there's a way in which I'm addressing audiences on both the right and the left in this project. So on the, on the right, I'm trying to undermine the idea that the capacity to earn more in market terms entitles you to receive more. And on the left, I'm trying to undermine the idea that you can do away with markets. So here's the problem. In any large-scale productive activity, you have to calculate the relative scarcity of different sorts of input. If we're delivering medical care, even if people aren't paying for it, so I'm a Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. Public health care system, but so it's publicly funded, but they've got to decide, should we buy more MRIs? Should we hire more nurses? Should we have more doctors? Which kind of doctors? How many? You know, there are all kinds of choices and trade-offs that we have to make in delivering health care. And, and uh, so in thinking about those, what you need is some way of calculating the the, the trade-offs, and you need, and pr a price system is almost unavoidable. It's not the only thing that you can use, it's not the only consideration, but it's a crucial consideration for making it possible for people to get information about the relative scarcity and relative advantages <coughs> of different kinds of inputs, compare them with one another, see how to mix them together, and, and what will lead to more uh, effective delivery of health care, or whatever else it is that you're producing. So the claim is here that People on the left are too complacent about not thinking about the institutional requirements of large-scale coordination of productive economic activity. I'm not saying you couldn't, so, so there's a subtitle to the project which is taming the market. I'm not saying you should accept the market in all its forms as it is, but I'm saying you can't do without it, and you can't just assume away the demands and workings of the market uh, when it becomes inconvenient. There's, there's a tendency in some people to say, well, I like the market, but I'm going to take away this part and that part, and not seeing that if you remove, if you're, you can't remove the functions of prices here and there without interfering with the function of prices. So you have to be thinking about you. There are ways to use taxes and subsidies, and regulations, those are all appropriate ways because, because market prices do not spontaneously always generate accurate information. So there are appropriate ways to, to kind of contain those and remove some things from the market entirely. Again, like healthcare uh, delivery, that's perfectly appropriate. But in the, in the productive organization, you're going to have to rely on prices. And in that context, in that context, just to take a concrete example, a doctor should get paid more than a nurse. Why is that? Because the doctor gets more training than a nurse, right? So from a social point of view, if you've invested eight years in training a doctor and two or three years in training a nurse, and you don't have a, uh, a price for the doctor's labor that reflects that, you'll hire too many doctors to do jobs that nurses could do. You won't make the appropriate trade-offs. So people have to get the information about the relative cost and the relative scarcity of different skills, and, the, and including the cost of training, and, and the decision makers have to have that information and have a motivation to, to work on that information. So here's the thing, so how can you get people to do that if they're not Profit, or, you know, kind of, well, capitalism, everybody's out for money, and that's what makes them do it. So if you remove that, how is it possibly going to work? Well, one answer is that that's actually, if you just step back and look at the way existing capitalist societies work, it isn't like that. Uh, so think about most of the people that you encounter in, who work in corporations. They are not the owners of corporations, but they have jobs in which they are expected to respond in one way or another to market signals. Lots of people, not everybody, uh, we just bought a pair of boots, the person just sold me a pair of boots, but, but the, the, that store will have a manager whose job is to try to calculate up. Do I need to hire more people? Do I need more stock? Do I? So their job is to figure out how to respond to market skills, market signals, so as to make that store profitable, right? Now, that profit is not going to the manager. The manager is getting a salary. Maybe that person can hope to get a promotion or something, but that person is not getting the profits. The person is playing a role, a social role. And, and that penetrates all of market systems, and so I'm just extending that further in a way. I'm, I'm saying that everybody will have a social role in which they will see their talents and skills as a kind of resource that they control, and they should respond to social signals about how to use that in ways that will contribute to society. Now, they shouldn't be just like the manager who 
may be largely indifferent to other things besides profit. So as an individual, you get to care about what kind of work you like to do, how close it is to your home, whether you like the people you're working with, all kinds of things which, indeed, in existing labor markets, people pay attention to. But, but you can pay attention also to, here's something that, that pays a high, so, so the, the basic picture here is, uh, we let the market work generate pre-tax income and then we tax it all away so that the ultimate income that people get is equal. And, but, but people are responding to the signals as though they were, as, as they would in a capitalist economy. So, so the advantage of this approach, broadly speaking, is it generates the kinds of attention to relative scarcity and to the cost of production that we want in, in taking uh, account of overall productive activity. And, and, uh, but you get the egalitarian outcome that I think is required as a matter of justice. So some people say, well, how could this possibly function? Because really, you know, if you think about the way things work in the world, people are responding to prices. But again, I say, start with existing capitalist systems. Take the idea that everybody should have a job. Now you might say, well, yeah, that's just because, you know, if you don't get a job, you don't get any income. Which is true, of course, that's a very important motivator. But that is not the only, you know, just think about your own own life. How many people, you know, are comfortable, again, think of the transformation of the gentleman aristocrat. How many people are comfortable not working, even if they can get away with it? Oh, yeah, there's the story of somebody winning the lottery and so on. Though, of course, if you hear those stories, usually their lives get wrecked, right? When people stop working. So there's a, there's a whole way in which we are taught from the time we're little and the social systems and structures are set up to encourage people to aspire to do work that will contribute to society, to take on social roles in which they will contribute to society. And the idea of having a, a job, that's a social norm. So, so my idea also involves social norms. It involves the internalization of social norms which are not, in this respect, fundamentally different from the social norms in the existing society. What it, what's fundamentally different is the underlying sense of the normative entitlement that you get because of the pre-tax income that is generated. But again, that's not so different from the, uh, the you know, if the manager of the local store earns a, a million dollars for the store, that person doesn't feel entitled to that million dollars. I said, well, I'm getting paid my salary. That's what I'm entitled to, and I, that's just the role I've played. So I want other, I want ordinary people to kind of take that attitude towards the kinds of work that they do. And just see this as it's a way of coordinating activities and making sure that everybody contributes. So, uh, you know what, I think I, I may just stop there. I'm more interested, in, so, so I'll just, the, the broad context for this, I'm at an early stage uh, uh, revisiting this earlier work that I did on economic equality, trying to think how to expand that into a kind of just world kind of format. And I'm really interested in any questions, challenges, puzzles, suggestions about what I have to think about, it's completely open. So let's hear what you have to say. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, can you say more about, maybe I misunderstood it, about profits? And I mean, right, because the critique is normally about that, you know, that the the profit is sort of unjustly rewarded to the capitalist who just you know invests their right. money and doesn't actually labor. So are you saying that you know the worker and the manager they would work, they'd get a salary, and then that would be reduced to be equal, and then and that money would be generated to go so yeah. right. Could you say more about what happens sure. with the profit. Right. So so dis distinguish here between the the money that goes to. Uh, capital and the money that goes to labor, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so labor is people work and they get salaries. And in fact, in in the in the current world, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of the high end wealth that is generated by labor income now. These highly specialized managers and so on. That's where a lot of the there's some new data coming out that's showing that's an important source. But there's the question of who owns the wealth. So obviously, one of the background presuppositions in my model is that the wealth is socially owned, owned. but that doesn't mean that it's centrally planned in terms of how it's organized. So uh, think of a, you know, a kind of, the crucial, question from my, the crucial question from my perspective is who gets to spend money on themselves? I don't care so much. There can be reasons to care about 
who makes the decisions about what investments we make and on what basis. But, and, and here you can have two different views. One is the key to having a productive economy is having m managers who make decisions about investments uh, on the basis of what will generate a profit. Notice that they, again, they don't get the profit. So now, who owns that capital? Well, society owns it. But, but the ownership can be highly indirect, as indeed, again, it is in existing capitalist systems. You have, uh, you know, you've got the company, and then you've got the hedge funds, who you, you've got many layers and levels between you know, what counts as ownership. And so ultimately, the, the ultimate level, in, in my model, is going to be social ownership. Nobody gets to take that money home and spend it on their private jets or their fancy apartments. Or every, everybody's, got, everybody's got the same money to spend. Then the question as to how to organize decisions about investment and productive activity and who controls that will depend in part on the arguments you make about what the consequences will be of having, doing it this way rather than that way. Maybe it turns out to be the case as an empirical matter that you get a lot more productive uh, output if you decentralize this and, and give a lot of discretion to uh, particular kind of groups of people that kind of like we have now the private hedge funds or the kind of people who are able to fund startups and so on. Because uh, if you make it all centrally planned, they're just, it's too awkward, it's too bureaucratic. So that, that's an empirical question. And I don't, claim, I don't claim to have any empirical expertise about that question. And, and I don't care so much. I mean, in some ways I'm attracted to something that democratizes that, but, but I'm open to the possibility that democratizing it will be inefficient. Be, you know, you'll lose a lot in productive output. So if that's the case, then it seems to me it makes sense to care mainly about how the contribution of productive output. If you lose a little and get democracy, you know, the extent of the trade-off is crucial. So I treat that as an empirical question to which I assume no answer. Is that helping? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. How is this going to work on a global scale? I mean, you have inequalities within a country, but you have much broader inequalities globally. So yes. how how exactly is that supposed to work? So, so the background presupposition here is that we live in a fundamentally unjust global order, and I'm trying to get people to see that. I've done that in my work on immigration, and, and then that's part of this work as well. But, so if you start from a recce... I sometimes use in my... When I give talks on immigration, I tell this story. Um, it's the, there's a New Yorker cartoon. It shows these two uh, kings talking to one another. One says... Uh, well, monarchy may not be the best form of government in principle, but it has always seemed the best form of government for me. <laughs> and, and so I say, well, that's sort of what we in the rich, affluent states of the West say. Do we ha is there any story you can tell about how organizing the world in this way, in which there are a few rich states and many poor ones, is really fair to everybody in the world? You know, there isn't any story. There isn't any plausible story you can tell about why that's good for everybody. So, what would be good for everybody? Well relatively egalitarian uh, arrangement. Now, what would those be? Is it the, the, the problem, it seems to me, is persuading people that that's what we have to construct, not we don't know how to do it. Uh, so, now this is different from the question of how you get there from here. How would you persuade the rich to give up? The, that's, another, that's another question which, frankly, uh, I'm not trying to address in this project. So it's a crucial question. How do you transform the world as it is into the world as it ought to be? But what I'm trying to to do is to challenge the underlying assumption that there is no alternative. So, so there'd be two ways of constructing there's no alternative. There is no alternative. One is, we got the power and we're not going to give it up. But that isn't the way they, people usually present it. They usually present it as though anything you try to do, even if you had the power and could reshape it, would be worse. That's, that's the general picture. You know, if you abolish slavery, those slaves are just going to be you know, they're going to be miserable. They don't know how to take care of themselves. You know, we're really, this is the, so, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of picture I'm trying to challenge. So it does require a picture, an assumption that everybody in the world matters. Further questions we could ask about non-humans, but all human beings in the world matter. And that we have to figure out a set of social arrangements in which their interests are reasonably taken into account. So at a minimum, if we imagine a world, which I'm perfectly willing to imagine, that's divided politically into independent units uh, with a lot of control over their own affairs, we will set up arrangements so that there are not vast differences, economic differences, between those units. And we have models for how to do that. You know, the European Union, for example. 
when it created so a not of, a lot of variety over there in terms of wealth. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. now I'm not talking about within the states, but between the states. So so one of the things that you can see is that this this is more an argument on barring from immigration stuff. The European Union has inequalities between states, so Sweden is a lot richer than Portugal. But you don't get mass movement from Portugal to Sweden. So why is that? You get some, but not mass movement. So in the European Union until recently, three percent of people lived outside their the country in which they held citizenship. It's very small. So some people move, but why? Well, because if you can have a decent life where you are, you know, why are you going to, you know, uproot, uh, move away from family, friends, the language, the culture, the institutions with which you're familiar, to what? Get a few more bucks to spend, buy a few more things? Some people will do that, but not that many. It's just an empirical point. The Polish, the Romanians. <laughs> well, so so there, the the, the uh, exactly. Yeah. So part of the issue that you see in the recent transformation of the EU is they didn't do what they had done earlier, which is to slow down the the free movement uh, part component uh, until in fact in fact I think Brexit is in part due to the fact that the UK, unlike many other rich states, didn't take advantage of you could delay the free movement for seven years and they didn't. And and uh, then that generated this backlash. So so the the point is you you get this free movement, you get this movement only under circumstances which people can see their lives are going to be much better elsewhere than they are at home. So once you create and there are ways of uh, as the EU had again in its earlier stages of equalizing conditions in the background among the different states. There are lots of mechanisms we can use to do that. I mean at the very at the very first level if you bought this general argument that we should try to equalize conditions between states, you think about things like the World Trade Organization, it would do things fundamentally different from what it's doing, right? Right now the World Trade Organization policies are constructed, we know that, to benefit the rich states. And they have the power and they can force the poor states to go along. So as a matter of justice, the first, the, you know, if you wanted to work some baby steps in that direction, the very first thing is you try to change the conditions with those kinds of rules and, and, and practices. But ultimately, you'd want a, a world in which the differences between political communities were no greater than they are between places like Canada and the United States or the relatively rich states of Europe and, and so on. And then, then you don't have to worry so much. So, so although I have a strict egalitarian kind of norm here, uh, you know, I wouldn't be so upset if there were small differences of income between, because you can imagine you get into things about purchasing power and the advantage of living with, you know, s small differences wouldn't matter so much. I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm trying to address it, but if not, tell me. No, you're up. You're up. That's right. Let's, let's, let's okay. we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, um, an important part of such an egalitarian ethos, if it's to be internationalized. Mm, yeah. It seems to me that an important part of uh, egalitarian ethos, if it is to be internationalized, could also um, have to be committed to reparations and large to distribution mm, of wealth mm. and other things that are not included. <coughs> and I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yes. Well, that's a very interesting question. Again, I think we have to distinguish here between the kind of world we want ultimately to achieve and what is the best way to move <coughs> in the direction of that world. So there's, I, I'm perfectly persuaded by the argument that uh, if you talk about uh, justice, there have been a lot of ex exploitation and things that have been done in the past for which reparations are warranted. Uh, and so that would be one way to move in this direction, is through, a, and I don't have a view as to whether that's the best strategy or not. It does seem to me that at the end of the day, what we want is a world in which there's relative equality among human beings, and at that point, uh, the the questions of heritage become le at the end point of that, of which we hope to be an ongoing, relatively stable kind of model, that questions about reparations do sort of disappear, right? Because you don't want other people to have more at the end of the day because their great-great-grandparents had been dispossessed and, and uh, abused. I mean, one wants social recognition of that. You don't want to forget that historically. But ultimately, the solution is not to then create a new subordinate class because of what their 
ancestors had done. But that doesn't mean that in terms of getting that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to arguments for reparations in the here and now because it may be that as a political matter, what people, you know, I don't really expect to persuade very many people about this vision. I want to get people talking about it, and I, but I don't expect a political movement to spring up in which, you know, this, they're going to adopt this. So, but it may be that in a particular time and place, people will be responsive to arguments for reparations or movements that will mobilize people. Fine, because that will be a movement in this general direction, but ultimately it's going to be different. First year, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, seems in your talk you focused, uh, you know, more on how the social product is to be distributed in an egalitarian fashion, mm -hmm. uh, and that you know eventually this would come down to equalized income. Uh, so one question, you know, is well, why equal income as opposed to equal resource? Isn't that a rather flat notion of equality, you know, kind of going on Ronald Dworkin's criticism? So I'd be interested to hear your comments about that. Uh, but maybe more, you know, confusing to me is uh, how is this market supposed to in any way organize us uh, since markets tend to distort based on who has ownership to begin with and who has control over uh, how initial resources are used and implemented. So are you thinking that there's going to be a kind of collectivized ownership of, you know, societal resources to begin with? Uh, or, you know, if you're going to allow kind of private ownership of, you know, natural resources and other sorts of uh, social resources, uh, how is that market ever going to kind of be a useful organizational tool that's not, so to speak, distorting in, in various ways. And to use your example about doctors and nurses, right, uh, what the investment is to become a doctor is really distorted, right? It's not simply a few more years of school. It's, you know, jacked up because people expect to get a certain income from this, right? And schools realize they can charge all of this. Um, would it be better if we had more doctors or people as skilled as doctors throughout our medical, you know, distribution of resources? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, but we won't do that because I think the market as it currently stands is distorted. Well, so I'll start with the doctors and I'll move back to private ownership. So, so <laughs> think about it again, you know, I, I grew up in the United States, lived in the United States for decades of my life, and then I moved to Canada. And, and you know, you go into the Canadian uh, thing and you show the, your card and you get treated. So how many doctors is there a shortage of doctors in Ontario? And how do they decide how many doctors to produce? So it's expensive to produce doctors. You have this medical training and supervision and so on. There's these eight years of training. So they have to think about that when they're deciding. Some, and there have been nurses shortages. There have been doctor shortages. That, you know, sometimes they make mistakes, right? But what they're trying to do is to figure out how to deliver the most effective health care uh, within a budget. But it's a budget, right? So. Uh, now, how do people decide whether to be, it's true now, how do people decide whether to be a nurse or a doctor? That is partly how much money they're going to make. So, or whether they can afford to get it. And whether they can afford to get it. But in the model of the egalitarian system that I'm imagining here, everybody's getting an equal income. So you are not foregoing income when you go to school, as you do today, so you don't need any compensation. Right now, if you have to work for eight years before you get an income, then it's reasonable for you to expect to get more income to make up for that later. But if you've been paid all those eight years, then it's not reasonable for you to expect to get that. Society should take that cost into account. They've funded you for those eight years. So that has to be calculated into the cost. You haven't been contributing. You've been a drain for those eight years in terms of economic resources. And so what we give as your salary, your nominal salary, should reflect that so that we don't produce too many of these. But it shouldn't over-exaggerate it. It should accurately reflect the cost of supporting somebody and providing them with that education for that period of training. That's what you want the price to, do, to be. And, and you want that to be reflected. I don't have any actual view as to whether that's more or less than the current. So, so, but there's no, there isn't any, first of all, the individual doctors don't now have a competitive, the individuals don't determine that market, whatever, the, I mean, apart from the fact that you get guild effects and so on. but. Uh, you know, the individual person is not determining his or her salary. That's set by larger forces over which the individual has little control. So it's, it's similar in that respect, but I'm assuming a context in which there's no, you don't have those kind of incentives for collective action by guilds that are going to distort the 
prices, right? You, but you do want these prices to actually reflect that. So now let's go to private ownership of the means of production. You talk about distortion. So I'd be interested to know what distortions you have in mind that flow from private ownership of the means of production. Uh, I'm not well, saying they don't. I'm just trying to know what you have in mind. Well, you know, if, if, uh, if universities and medical schools, for example, are privately owned, uh, and, you know, they're able to accrue some large share of those means uh, of training, well, then they're going to set the price according to, you know, what they can, you know, manage to reap from, from the public. But why so, are they going to do that? So, to take universities. Uh, why are they going to do that? Well, you know, I ask my question, this question at my university all the time. Uh, well, but so, so one answer is, I, I take it, if it's a private university, it's so they can make a profit for the shareholders, if that's what you're imagining. Of course, what we know is actually private universities in the American context are, for the most part, overwhelmingly non-profit institutions. They're not actually held by shareholders. That's not money going into pocket. Now, the managers actually think that's their job, to raise money to, uh, you know, to, to do that at the... Uh, Maybe to get what the market. Notice they're responding to market signals. But they're not responding to market signals because that is money in their profit or even money in the hands of the shareholder's profit. It's, here's another way to think about this model. It's like whether or not you think that a good social just a way of get, getting at the truth of legal matters is by having an adversary system. So you, you have a lawyer arguing on one side, you have a lawyer arguing on the other side and a judge that, or, and possibly a jury that decides, you know, here's the arguments and makes a decision. And that can be true in civil cases as well as criminal cases, right? So some people think that's a good way to do it, some people think a bad way to do it, there are advantages and disadvantages. But suppose you were persuaded that it was a good way to do it. Then it's important that the people who have that role play that role. But, you know, they're, they're playing a role. So again, when you come to the kind of, the people who are running the Yales and the Harvards, you know, they're playing a role. Now, we may think that's a destructive role. It's a distorted role. It's been so, so fine I'm for then reconstructing it, right? But they're already playing a social role. They are not, in that sense, uh, so, so the, they are not, in that sense, being driven by personal profit. It's not, they're not, it isn't the logic of capital. It's the logic of a certain set of institutional arrangements. As, and every set of institutional arrangements will have a logic, right? So we can tell the story about the distortions that you get when you have private investment, and there's also a story about the distortions that you get from public investment. And so you have to you have to think about the relative risks and advantages of the different and ways of combining them. And so the current problem is that the benefits actually go in the form of wealth and income that's available for consumption to a tiny, tiny group of people. If though if the ultimate benefits of the arrangements went to everybody, then it seems to me we, sh we would be somewhat less concerned. We wouldn't completely be indifferent to, but we'd be somewhat what, less concerned about whether this arrangement, you know, there'd still be disputes. People disagree. Better to have decisions made collectively. It's better to have decisions made with a small group, you know. I don't know. Think about hiring. So at our university, the hiring decision is made in a committee. Lots of places the hiring decision is made by the entire department. There are advantages and disadvantages. So this has nothing to do with money. You can see there are advantages and disadvantages of each set of arrangements. And, and you can argue about that. People have different views. And, and, and so what you might want to do is experiment with different kinds of organizations. What I care about is the ultimate uh, benefits of the economic productive activity. And so it's less contingent upon arguments about particular arrangements with particular cases. Uh, you go. There are some discussions in some places about providing people with a basic income. Yeah. That is irrespective right. of merit-based or anything. If everybody just had a basic income and no one had a private income, would that be an implementation of your idea? Well, and it, that's one. It's actually, in some ways, it's it's a little bit intention, but I'm sympathetic to the arguments for basic income. First of all, as a transitional thing, I'm quite sympathetic to the arguments for basic income, which is a, have many advantages. Uh, although there are people who argue that it's better to focus on providing more things through public services. and. You know, that's a, that's a dispute within the left that, that I don't have a strong view on. Uh, the difference between the basic income model and my model is that basic income is a floor. I want to set a ceiling. That I'm is, saying if there were no other income, basically income oh. 
basic income was given to everybody and supplanted private income, would that be your model? Yeah, right. So the only reason to hesitate about that would be whether or not you thought that uh, there would be a large number of people, it wouldn't matter if there were a few people, a large number of people who wouldn't work at all and contribute and that that would reduce the overall social output and that it's important to keep up. So there are a number of background assumptions that I haven't spelled out. One is that we want to have a high level of productive output. Some people might think that's a bad idea, so then you wouldn't be so interested in generating that. Uh, another is the, the question of whether or not you can get people to contribute to productive output if there is an absolute cut between what they do and whether, whether they work at all and whether they get an income. So it's an empirical question, and I'm not sure about the answer, whether you could get people to work if there were no, everybody's got their basic income, doesn't matter whether you work or not, and we motivate you to work for other means. I, I think that would probably work, and that would be fine. I'd be perfectly happy with that. Everybody's getting the same basic income, and the, all this other stuff is just the social roles that you play. So, so if that's the given, <clears throat> yeah. then would there be a prohibition against accumulating wealth? But we started out no accumulated wealth. Right. Would not people start to accumulate some people? So this, this goes back. Somebody had How raised. How do you get rid of capital? Somebody had raised the question about the uh, the Dworkin kind of uh, model and so on. So so there are two different kinds of capital. There's kind of personal capital, if you will, personal wealth and social wealth. So capital as productive wealth. Uh, it, is ultimately the, the you know doesn't provide personal benefits to anybody the fact that you own the factory you're making decisions about it but you can't eat a factory you can't you know sleep in the factory you know so so we might want nobody should have be the single one making that decision maybe it should be the workers maybe it should be I'm open on that question what I don't want is for people to have uh, high levels of individual advantage. So then the question becomes, but to what degree does that interfere with individual choice? So some people say, look, let's give everybody a fixed amount of money at birth or at adulthood, and then they'll make their wise decisions or their poor decisions, and that's fine, we don't care about that. There's the further question, so, so that's one model. I'm skeptical of that myself, that's why I'm more drawn to the annual income kind of thing. I, I think there's, we have some reasons to be wary of that kind of... Uh, uh, so, it will be the case, even in the most egalitarian system one can imagine about, that some people will be lucky and some people will be unlucky in their choices and in their preferences. You know, you get a house, and then it turns out that that's, there are changes in society and that house is particularly well located or badly located or whatever. You know, your apartment, and, you know, you can, in New York, you have experiences of this all the time, right? And you can't eliminate those sorts of variations. You can reduce the extent to which they have an impact on people's lives by evening out, you know, when you're dealing with annual income, then you limit the capacity of people to accumulate uh, and dispose of. So, so you would want to, you would certainly in this society prohibit anything other than personal kinds, you know, kind of personal memento kinds of inheritance. You wouldn't want any large amounts of money that could be inherited. So the idea is people would spend their income as they get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and, and of course, you wouldn't be worried about saving for retirement. Why would you save for your old age? Right. right. Now, you know, kind of, could you save up because you wanted to go on a fancy vacation as opposed to going on a modest vacation? Sure. We, you know, there'd be things you'd have to think about of that sort. Right? Okay. Uh, Josh? Um, so I'm wondering, I, I think it gets into the stuff that you were just talking about, actually. Uh, so. I get why my, one might want to be a doctor instead of a nurse or instead of a brain surgeon. Yeah, that's the type of thing that people make a TV show about or whatever. Sure. Um, but when you think about these managers who are responding to market signals, even though they're not going to drive the profit from the sort of adeptness of their response and things like that, I'm wondering, like, I mean, I've been in a lot of jobs where the difference between being a manager and not being a manager, it's not necessarily that you get so much out of it. It's not necessarily, I mean, I've worked in restaurants where I felt like everybody, anybody could have been the manager. And the only reason anybody would have wanted to be the manager is because they got paid more to do it, right? And because responding to those market signals, yes. it's just a lot of extra work. It's awful. Right. It's a horrible thing. Right. And so I'm wondering, how are we going to motivate people to fill these roles that aren't necessarily, I mean, they're not going to be responsive to comparative advantages. They don't have these compensatory, like, you know, this is my calling, and so I'm going to do it. How are we going to get people to fill all those roles in the economy that, like, suck? 
It's a very good. <laughs> yes, it's a very good question. I do try to talk about it in, in, in the paper. So the key issue here is whether or not you think taking work work patterns as a whole. Do you think that the jobs that require scarcer talents and skills, the jobs that are harder to fill, with or in which how the skills of the person who fills them matters more. So, so in your case, what's interesting is you're saying this is a job anybody could do, but nobody wants to do it. Yeah. Right. So, so on the one hand, you're rejecting the notion there's some special ability required to do this job, that scarce talents and skills, and on the other hand, you're presenting it as a more burdensome form of work. Now, my sense is, as a general matter, that if you look at our economy, the jobs that nobody wants to do are not the jobs that get extra pay. It's the shit work, right? It's, it's the minimum wage. How many people want the minimum wage jobs? So, so if I'm wrong about that, if in fact, so, so it is true that in a market system, markets, price differentials compensate for a lot of things. And one thing that they compensate for, in principle, is the, is the relative unpleasantness of the work. So if you have two people who are equally talented and skilled and they've got a choice between jobs, and, and one job both agree is more miserable than the other, then you have to pay somebody more to take that job. That's true. That's a kind of classic economic model. So it matters a lot whether or not you think that the way the market works today is largely through compensation for the unpleasantness of different work. And so, on one account, uh, Jerry Cohen actually talks about what you really want to do is have a balance. You don't want to have equal income. You want to have something that balances income and burden. So I have some other work in which I say, well, that's a nice idea in principle, but it's a classic example of something that you cannot institutionalize. Because what's burdensome to one is not burdensome to another. There's too many subjective elements. You create incentives for people to see burdens. You know, if, I, if I'm going to get paid more because I dislike the people I'm working with, I suddenly don't like them as much. You know, There are all kinds of things that happen that are distortions that you go in. So, so it does matter a lot whether or not you think that, you know, on the whole, there will be people who would rather be bosses than, you know, rather be giving the orders than taking them. And that's my sense, is that it's not to say there wouldn't be any things like this where you have kind of a problem, but that on the, on the whole, most people would rather... Now, I wouldn't rather be a dean myself. You know, I don't know who would be the dean. But I know there are people... People get a kick out of the power. They like the sense of... And actually, I think institutions function... They really matter. If you have good institutional leaders as opposed to bad ones, there's a huge difference to my life and the life of people. In so it's not that I think all deans are bad. You know, I, when you get good people in those jobs, it makes a huge difference to the institution. So... So that's what you'd hope, is that people would be drawn to these jobs because they're trying to make a contribution. But there, there would also be these ancillary attractions that currently exist and would still exist about power and, you know, kind of recognition and determining and so on. So, so it, is, it is contingent upon assuming that most inequalities in the market are not compensatory, but are additive. I have a question back. I have a lot of questions. So that's great. A little bit oh. Yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm... I'm sort of wondering how close you think, so the, the, the sort of price of the labor is just supposed to be like a signal about what society wants in some right. way, it doesn't reflect your actual income. Right. How much do you expect those signaling prices to resemble prices for labor now? Because it seems to me that lots of prices for labor are like sort of cemented prices that have to do with like historical class struggle. Sure. Like care workers and farm workers weren't included in right. the National Labor Relations Act, so right. they get paid less now. Right. So how much will, so once, you know, background condition is production is socialized, so once that happens, how much would then prices for labor have to be adjusted and what would um, the mechanism uh, for that uh, be? Or would prices be mostly sort of what we get for prices now so that somebody who's like working in like uh, a factory uh, in like the global south somewhere, like their the price for their labor will still be like low, but that's just a signaling thing. They'll get as much money as somebody uh, in the global north, um, or is there some way that that will have to be um, that price system will have to be corrected um, to reflect uh, output in some way? Because it seems to me like you know there's some workers who like produce the thing and then they paid a certain amount, but then uh, sort of in the global north where like that value is then realized, like the advertising executive who just advertises the product. Right. Uh, gets paid a lot more. So uh, how would how would uh, that pricing system uh, work? Like in in that sort of moment of transition, 
uh, do you think? Well, so again, you know, I'm trying to put a picture on the table of where we want to get to, not how we get there. And so those are fair questions, that they're perfectly reasonable questions, but I don't claim to have an answer to the transition question. It seems to be the question that I have to answer, accepting my limitations, is do I think that in the kind of, uh, after the revolution, after all these changes take place, you would see the same kind of variation in prices that you see today. And I'm actually ag agnostic about that. So I accept what you say about, you know, uh, the various ways in which prices today are not actually a reflective of relative scarcity or cost and so on and so forth. Um, but there are at least some cases in which uh, we get examples of uh, um, scarcity pricing in which the, the, uh, the people at the very top and arguably the people at the very bottom. So here's the, this, I'll step back one minute. The classic argument in a kind of market context is, uh, of course, skilled labor is going to be more expensive than unskilled labor because anybody can do unskilled labor, but only the people with the skills can do the skilled labor, right? That's the kind of basic kind of claim. So it's scarcer, and often it requires some training. So there's an investment component and there's a natural scarcity component, and so that's that price ought to, the price ought to be higher to reflect that. Uh, or it will be higher because people will be competing for it. And the, the skilled person can always do the unskilled job and sometimes has to. Okay, so, so, uh, so think about professional athletes. Yeah, I used the example in my paper about Tanaka getting $159 million to play baseball. He likes to play baseball. You know, he doesn't have to be paid 100. He doesn't have to be motivated to 159 dollars to play baseball. So why does he get 159 million dollars? And he's just a guy. So with the corporate executives, you know, sometimes there's manipulation of these. The reason they're getting paid so high is they control the boards, and you know, you can say this is manipulation. But Tanaka's not manipulating. He's just he's got these skills. So why are the Yankees willing him to willing to pay him that? They think he's going to win baseball games for them. And then that's going to make them money. They're driven and making a calculation. That's going to fill the seats. That's going to make them money. And that's why they're willing to pay him this horrendously high salary. So when you see cases like that, and professional athletes are a nice example because they are people who are not, don't come in as, they don't have their own power other than their kind of, the scarcity of their talents and skills and external calculations about what the relative consequences for the, for the organization will be of having this one rather than that one. And so there's a competition for their talents and skills. That's the, that's the other, the reason he's paid the 159 million is because if they don't pay him that, somebody else will pay him 150 million and he'll go to them, right? So, so these are cases where you've got scarce talents and skills that are highly rewarded and can't be traced to the power of the individual who is receiving the reward. And, and uh, it, that serves a, an important, you know, it's an example. So one can argue it's not an isolated exception. That's where you get the contestation. How true is that of these other kinds of things? Look, if you don't really think that markets work, that these price signals, uh, by and large, communicate information about relative scarcity of talents and skills, uh, then you shouldn't use a price system. But you've got to tell me what your alternative picture is, because we have experience with central planning. And we see, leave aside the negative, you know, kind of, uh, even, when it done, even when it's done with the best of intentions, it makes a lot of mistakes. So you, you have to have something, again, this is what I started with, you have to have something to put in, some story that you're going to put in its place. Who's deciding? Oh, this, this doesn't deserve this much, this. So if there's a dynamic, if there's a market dynamic, which is in fact, of course, what you see to some degree, that the wages in China are going up, so now they're moving to someplace else, and you know, that's part of the market dynamics, right? The, the very low wage. So, so there's, then the market is responding to that and, and then driving the prices up. And at some point, you would expect the logic of the economic, the unfettered market is that the logic of those wages will equalize over time, if permitted to do so. That's very unsettling to the workers in the, so that's separate from the advertising. And now I'm not talking about whether the advertising executive here deserves his or her fancy salary or not. But in a way, the presupposition of your argument was that the person didn't. 
and I don't know that I want to assume that. Um, I'm going to intervene because sure. I'm distressed by the unegalitarian nature of this picture, in the sense that um, even I know it's aspiring to be, but the emphasis just on income, um, as though that will make us equal. And I mean, the question is, what is the value that you're uh, appealing to? Is it just sort of people? having enough stuff, or what is the value that supports the idea that that will suffice to establish equality? It does nothing for exploit, you know, exploitation in the Marxist sense, this picture, because uh, we still have, and even in terms of income, if you want to phrase it that way, I mean, uh, the power relations at work, people controlling the lives of other people, telling them what to do, is not, not addressed by this. Uh, but even in terms of income, you know, in the U.S., I think, what is it, the, you know, CEOs um, get 200 times, 900 times, I've heard right. different figures, that of the average worker. Wouldn't that be corrosive even if you take it away from them? I mean, that establishes us as, um, you know, um, just worth less even if it doesn't amount to less income. Um, so that's a problem. The other issue is this idea of choice of, of occupation, as though, I mean, it's a select, a lot of people here are probably hoping they don't have to work for Uber, you know, I hope nobody does, but there isn't all that much choice for a very large part of the working um, population. Right. And so how would, um, how, and, and it's not as though, um, you know, the income, to, the prices of labor, it's, it's, there's unfairness built into that as well. And um, how would we address the issue of meaningful work and of um, generating more genuine choices for people? That would have to be part of this picture if we're going to have any real equality in it because you can't really tell from my optimistic, idealistic point of view, what, what people's talents are unless they all have an opportunity to develop them. And that doesn't just take place through education at the beginning, though that's clearly important, but through their whole careers. If they don't have a chance to practice at an occupation, you won't know what their talents are. So this whole emphasis on just convincing the talented that they should contribute kind of omits uh, both the issues of power and uh, control within the workplace and the idea of meaningful work and the problems that, that would remain of a kind of corrosiveness of um, differential right. evaluations. Um, so I'm in favor of a market in goods, but I'm wary about just adopting the market in labor as it currently presents itself. So that's a variety of challenges. Right. Okay, so, so I'm quite sympathetic to the aspirations, the egalitarian aspirations, all of which you identify, which are equality of social esteem, uh, equal participation in important decisions, equal opportunities to make choices, and, like choices and career paths and so on. So, you know, I share all those aspirations. Uh, part of the question is, just because these are, you know, it seems to me, again, we can't just, we, and we ought not just to assume that we can have everything we want. We have to think about how we are going to construct institutions that realize that in practice and think about the trade-offs among different choices. So, one of the reasons I cited the, the, the Tanaka example is, you know, in that case, there are people who have reason to believe, and I, you know, kind of completely self-interested reasons to believe Tanaka is going to make a difference, so they're willing to pay him $160 million. Doesn't that make the other baseball players who, you know, don't make it to the pros or, you know, who are the marginal pro players never, or, the, or in the minor leagues or only play as, uh, you know, amateurs, doesn't make that, that make them feel bad? Well, it might make them feel bad and it might not. That partly is a function of whether or not they see these as simply social signals that are serving a certain kind of... Now, in our society, you know, people who have these aspirations have all these money, it's just kind of glamour, but, but if, if all this was was a signaling kind of thing... So, this goes to your CEO. There are lots of uh, companies that think, you know, whether we get the right CEO or not, it's like whether we get the Tanaka or not. You know, if we get the right one, we're going to win games, we're going to win the World Series, and if we don't, we're going to, you know, go out of business, it's a competitive world. So, we think this is the right person to be the leader for the company uh, who's going to turn it around, who's going to make all the difference. You could assume, no, that's never the case. 
okay, if it's never the case, let's not pay them. But I don't want to assume it's never the case. I want to be open to the possibility that it is the case, that that kind of, that kind of one person makes a big difference. And then, how to get that person in the right position, you have to have signals. And precisely what you see, the driving it up, you know, they had very effective baseball teams when people were getting a maximum of $5,000, you know, it's, you get these six... Mondragon in Spain is the sixth largest corporation in Spain, and they have a worker-managed system that impose it, that they have decided should be limited to seven to one, and they're still doing great. So there's also so, but, counter... No, but, the, but here you pick an isolated it. example no, it's with the managers. Yeah, no, I, I read about Mondragon, I know about Mondragon, I think Mondragon is great, but the question becomes, First of all, does, to what degree do, does it depend upon having managers in Mondragon who are committed to this collective enterprise? At what point when the Mondragon manager can make a hundred times more by going to a conventional firm, does he or she choose to do so? So, so if they don't, it's because they have a normative commitment to this kind of enterprise, which is powerful and I'm for it. But, but so now imagine a world, my world, in which everybody's getting the same amount of money at the end. And the question is whether you stick with your self-managed Mondragon firm, even though, from a social point of view, if you were to go work for, uh, I don't know, Fiat or somebody, you would make a much bigger difference to how much you would make the right decisions, and so as a result, we'd have more, uh, let's make it the ecologically sound uh, you know, output, and so better cars that did less destruction to the environment, We'd have, we'd have a better social output because we're getting the person with the talents and skills in the right leadership role. You want to assume that that won't happen, that that, that, or it will happen spontaneously. I'm saying you need information, <coughs> communication, signals about who are the right people for the right jobs. And if, you, if you're not going to use prices to send those signals, you've got to explain to me what signals you are going to use. And when you have kind of large-scale coordination issues, with investment. But anyway, okay, let's let me uh, not monopolize. Yeah, you can wait. Um, uh, I have a question regarding uh, how this is going to function on a global scale because you're talking about price signals and in our society, like, wages are different in different areas of the world. In the egalitarian society, would the prices <coughs> become similar all over the world? Or would people that live in certain parts of the world still profit from being in that area over other areas? Uh, would I the think, egalitarian right. system be global, and would prices be global, or would it still so, would there still be differences? So I think what if if the, if the differences between states, mm -hmm. uh, the economic differences between states were largely eliminated, then you would expect most of the price differences between states would be eliminated. Not entirely, you know, I don't know if you ever study these things, you can find purchasing power parity uh, in, you know, what is a Canadian dollar worth compared with a, a US dollar? It doesn't tell you, you know, getting the exchange rate doesn't tell you what you can buy in Canada as opposed to buying the United States for a dollar. You know, that's a different, that's a slightly different figure. But these are small variations, right? They're not, they're not the order of magnitude that you get from a rich country to a poor country. So you would have the same small vary. You couldn't eliminate those small variations where there's kind of the local prices are a little different from international prices. But you'd expect the most prices in that sense would be the same, apart from the kind of local advantages of, you know, well we grow this stuff here and they don't. If you're not paying the shipping costs, of course it's cheaper. There are going to be things like that. But yes, prices would largely be comparable in all societies, just as. What are the price differentials within the United States? It's a huge country. You know, what are the price differentials? Well, there are some, but they aren't very big, right? I mean, housing, uh, housing prices. No, I grant you about housing prices. And so, housing is a huh? Food different costs. Food, gasoline, across water, housing. Well, yeah, anything so that has to be transferred over different? geographically difficult yes. terrain. Well, when you say vast, you mean what? We're not saying so vast is what it costs for food in in uh, uh, Ghana as opposed to New York. That's vast. What it costs for food in in New York as opposed to I don't know Mississippi is significant. It's noticeable. Order of magnitude. Of oh, what? Order of magnitude is ten. 
10 times as much for what? Cost of living. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I travel around here and there. I go into stores. Uh, you know, I do see, oh, gee, the milk here is expensive or the, you know, food. But I, I never see something that costs 10 times as much any place in Canada or the United States. I have a Canadian example. Yeah. Okay, so there's places in Nunavut, a carton of water. Oh, Nunavut. Oh, well, sorry. Right. Okay. Nunavut. So, so the, no, dollars, fair enough. Fair enough. It's a perfectly fair point. Of orange juice. So, 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 but the point is, Nunavut, uh, if for those of you who don't know, is, you know, in the Yukon, is, is in the far north, you know, it's like next to Alaska. So it's very, very expensive to transport stuff up there. And it would be a perfectly fair thing to say that if you're going to think about egalitarian arrangements, that you have to think about, there should be adjustments for cost of living. I, I, I'm perfectly, that you should adjust the annual income to reflect the cost of living in the, in where you're located. And, and so that people aren't having to so that they can live the same kind of life, basically. Now, you know, there are some technical questions about how you go about doing that and what it would apply. So, so I didn't mean to deny that there aren't particular examples in which you find vast differences. I, what I meant to deny was that for the vast majority of the population, it's a very small population in Nunavut, as it is in these cases, in these places that are, now it's important not to neglect them, but it, they are very small numbers compared with the vast majority of where people live. Can uh, I have a question? Yeah. So my, my question or concern has to do with what we can um, demand of individuals, not as political actors, but as in, right. in terms of right. um, personal economic motivations right. and behaviors within a market system, yes. before we start to compromise certain key elements of a market ethos that you don't highlight in the paper. So you talk about the norm of honesty in a market, right. which is very important. but. So much of what I think um, sustains a market system has to do with the motivation of the agents as economic actors. In other words, it has to do with the pursuit of economic self-interest, not by everybody all of the time, but in general. So I wonder if um, by severing or if by, let's say, systematically weakening that motivational link, so by by asking people to take signals from the market, and if I've understood your paper, to essentially mimic the pursuit of their economic self-interest, um, but to do it based on a different set of motivations, to do it based on you know, their commitment to egalitarianism. Right. I wonder if you don't run the risk of ultimately unraveling um, certain key elements, perhaps the key element of a market ethos as we currently accept and understand it. So, so the question is, um, it, it really rests on a broader question, I think, about the compatibility or the coherence of, and, and I completely appreciate the effort to think of an alternative, but I'm wondering about the compatibility of an alternative that tries to be committed at the same time to right. egalitarianism and to a market system as we currently understand it, for example, or especially when it comes to the motivations of agents within a marketplace. Right. So th this is a great question, and it's one of the central things that I'm struggling with. So there's a whole um, intellectual view on the left, which is that uh, you know it is the neoliberal mentality which is the problem, and it's and it pervades everything. And I, I'm 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 not unsympathetic to that critique. You can see the way in which people start relating to one another in many different aspects of life through this kind of calculation of uh, advantage. Uh, and and, uh, and this, so it's, that's why it's taming the market. We have to con constrain that. I want there to be spheres of life in which people don't engage with that. So, uh, so, so notice that by talking about equal income, there's going to be some collective expenditures. I'm assuming that people will have that some kind of. Is, do you, how do you decide? You know what you're going to buy, what you're going to close, where you're going to live, what food you eat. You know, you, you will be driven in part by whether it costs more. You say, oh, the price of that gone up. I'm going to get this instead. You're going to have to get trade-offs. I'd rather do this than that. You're going to have that kind of market mentality as a consumer, which we don't, which I don't propose to eliminate. Which seems to me an appropriate, again within confines, an appropriate way for people to make choices about how they live their lives. That's only one component. It's not the most important. If that's all people are obsessed with is what they consume, then they're living impoverished lives. And, and I am assuming in the background that 
this is one important component of life. It's not the only important component of life. And once, for, for most human beings, if their economic security is taken care of, then they will be less obsessed with these kinds of things and have more space for other kinds of things. So, so that's the kind of... But, but you, really the heart of it is, can you get people to choose career paths, work choices, without them being so tuned in to how much they're going to get out of it? And I don't see why not, because I, it seems to me that even as it stands, the kind of choices people make about what... Now, look, if you have basic income, and everybody gets it, a lot of people won't take the ship work. That's right. And that's one of the virtues of basic income. We're going to have to get those jobs done in some other way, because if, if you don't, if it isn't contingent upon, you know, you, you just won't take that Uber job or the, or the McDonald's job. So. So then we've got to find some way to make that work satisfactory, and th there's a tension there. But if you think that there's, this is really necessary work, picking up the garbage, maybe the Uber isn't necessary, maybe the, the, some of it is really necessary work and it's unpleasant. Uh, maybe we can share it out. Maybe we can find other mechanisms. Okay. But once you get beyond that level of the really unpleasant and currently low paid work, then it seems to me you will get uh, yes, I don't see I don't see that it's unrealistic to think that people will feel when I ask my students, how many of you want to find a job in which you will contribute to society? I was surprised the other day I asked this class. Everybody said yes. They all said they wanted a job. Now, they also want a job where they're going to make money, what they're what they're finally going to choose. Is, but that's an important motivation that people have. They want to feel good about themselves. So the idea that you know. You brought up in a society where the idea is, yeah, and we are, we're all contributing to ourselves. That's one part of life. It's only one part of life. We're all contributing, and you should get a job and contribute. I don't think it's that hard. In the back, we have two questions. Yeah. Thank you. In some countries where uh, Could you maybe stand? Yes. In some countries where the public sector is still an important employer, uh, by law there are ceiling on the uh, right. maximum uh, income. And usually it's like 20 times or 40 times uh, the income of the minimum. Uh, right. So do you think that maybe that can inspire the private sector in the future as a part of the corporate social responsibility to adopt a certain uh, a notion of a ceiling for uh, income? Also, I have another question about the, the role of the state in uh, the developmental state in generally, not only in the, in the, in the US, but uh, globally, in terms of leveling the playing field and uh, facilitating access to skills and to uh, knowledge, which would allow people to have equal opportunities uh, for generating income. Right. OK, I'll take the second first. So uh, again, one of the presuppositions, which I haven't spelled out maybe about distributing income equally, is that that's going to make a huge difference for equality of opportunity, right? That right now, people with more money spend that money uh, lots of times to buy advantages for their children. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, if everybody's got the same income, they're not able to do that. Uh, you, you can't have, uh, oh, the rich people live in this neighborhood and they have better schools. There won't be any rich people, right? So, so equality of opportunity, it seems to me, is... is is much enhanced, it's not entirely solved, but it's much enhanced by equality of income. Uh, so that's one point in response to the second one. Uh, and so, of course, I'm in favor of that. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to overstate this thing about uh, you're suggesting people have uh, caps on public sector, and that's true even in a capitalist country like the United States, which, you know, is all for the market, but it's not actually, the, but politicians don't get paid huge sums, right? So why do people become politicians? They do so for the power. And maybe they, they'll cash in after they get out. That's another poss possible sort of motivation. So I, I am inclined to, you know, as a kind of modification of what I've been saying, I think it would be a good thing if there were a culture that, in which, you know, uh, there, there wasn't a need to have a precise market price for the most talented, you know, that you'd take a better job, you know, a more challenging job because it was more challenging, because you thought you could do it, uh, and you'd contribute more. That would be fine. I mean, I do think you have contexts like, again, with the professional athletes, 
So why would you move from one team to another? Uh, and, and notice that lots of times professional athletes make those choices, you know, not just on the basis of money. They make a choice on where they think they can win the championship and they give up money in order to do that because they got a lot, they got more money than they can spend anyway. But so, so even in existing markets, we make decisions about what to do that are not simply based on how much money we will make. We make those decisions all the time. But the money serves this signal. It serves as a signal. And if you're going to remove that signal, you have to ask yourself, what is the cost of removing that signal? And if the answer is, now, if you assume there is no cost, I'm with you. Let's remove it. But what if there is a cost? You know, it's, it's, so part of my challenge here is to say, let's not just assume that everything is going to work out the way we'd like it. That we can, that we can eliminate the inequalities we see of power for going back to the workplace. If you could have an egalitarian arrangement of power in the workplace and get the same efficiency, yeah, let's have a equality of power. Now, what if you can't? What if it turns out it's just more efficient to have a hierarchy? So I, I want to consider that possibility and not have my argument depend on, it seems to me it's always tempting to assume that things are going to work in the world the way you want them to work. I'm tempted, though, to jump in and challenge you on the same point because what if, I don't know about this issue of motivation. So from a very different standpoint, why aren't you just sort of supposing that people will still be motivated to work without uh, material incentives? Um, what happens if they don't or if a, a large number of them are, well, uh, are lazy and just choose not to? Would you go the direction of Pablo Gilabert who criticizes you and proposes legal or um, so again, the, the issue here has to do with what we decide collectively, uh, how important it is to uh, try to generate as much productive output as possible. So there are lots of people who say, hey, this is the problem. We're producing more and more stuff. We're wrecking the environment. We're ruining our lives. No, no. So, so if you took that view, uh, then you would not want to mandate people working. You'd be happy that people don't want to work. That's fine. But if what you think, and it's implicit in Pablo's perspective, is that no, it is important that we, because we want health care, we want uh, you know, adequate food, we want education, there are, there are goods, not just you know, disposable consumer goods, but important human goods that are served by productive activity. And we need to get people to do that. Yes, then there would be a legal requirement. So, so that's, I, I completely agree. And that went, it was a response to an earlier question about basic income. One reason I don't present it is just a basic income. I say there'll be an expectation. It could be legally enforced, but you have to get a job. Oh, you you do think that? Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. Oh, I thought it, you in your in that older paper you say it's It's going to be voluntary. Well, again, it depends on whether or not you think people are going to be willing. So that that springs back to this question. So it, it seems to me the heart of that is again, who's going to do the shit work? I, uh, my assumption is most human beings, they don't want to sit around and do nothing all day. They want challenging activities, most human beings. But that doesn't mean they don't want to do lousy stuff. So if, if we see, we don't, if we can get rid of the lousy stuff, let's get rid of it. But if we can't, then we should find ways to share, share it out. Uh, I think there was one more question. We have to stop. Last question. Yeah, I just, there, there's something that is uh, puzzling to me. I mean, genuinely puzzling. I'm trying to think this through about uh, this, uh, the incentive of wanting to contribute more. I mean, to, to do work that will contribute. And, 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 and let's say for the sake of argument that what is, that people think about when they begin their careers or choose their career, right. you know, remains constant as they go from, right. you know, to one specialty or another, you know, and they go on. But when people say, uh, what I'm looking for is a job that I can make a contribution to society for, uh, it, it seems to me odd that the next thought would be, and therefore, the job I want is the one that the market would compensate for the most. It would be odd in our world, yes. Would, no, but I mean, it would, I mean, it would be odd in our world, but, but why? Because that's... Because in our world, market prices reflect, as in all markets, the patterns of demand. And in our world, the patterns of demand reflect the vastly unequal distribution so that what is demanded through the market reflects the existing inequality of, of prices and therefore is badly skewed. We don't have, 
But in, in the world I'm imagining, everybody's got an equal income, so the demand is democratic and is supplemented by collective expenditures on appropriate things like health care and other things that are differentially incurred that we want to be collectively provided. So, so market prices are now reflecting what we think the community wants produced, taking community in some genuine sense. Right. So they're so, very different kinds of prices. So, what they so, so, at some, so at some level, though, yeah. in, in the utopia, right, yeah. that the way it's supposed to work is I'm, I'm thinking what I want to do is I want to contribute in my, in as best I can use my abilities, right. and then I'm going to look to the, the, this uh, quasi labor market demand right. uh, system and say, you know, where, where, you know, where, where is the demand most needed? Right. And, and that's where I'm going to put in all my effort. Correct. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, it seems th there's something that I'm, I'm not... So part of the problem is seeing. that, you know, you have to imagine people trying to decide, well, should I, I be a, doc a doctor or a lawyer or a, a CEO, you know, if I have those capacities? Should I be a poet or, you know, go to work? Well, you know, how do you... And, and if part of... You no, know, partly you get to pay attention to what you enjoy doing, but bracket that up, let's assume you say, I like all this stuff, I like doing it all. How do you decide? What is, what, somebody's got to tell you, this is, you know, th this is where you can really make it. Now, in our world, if you want to make a contribution, it's hard, it seems to me, maybe they tell themselves that, for you to persuade yourself, you know, going into finance, this is how I'm going to make a contribution to society, this is how you're going to make a lot of money. It's not actually, you know, how you're going to make a contribution. But, but, but the fact that, and so then you can make judgments about you can go work for an NGO or you can do this or that, you know, you can be a teacher, you can kind of make decisions based on your judgments about what you think society needs, but you have no way of assessing how many other people could do that, what are your special talents and skills, how do they compare with what others can contribute. And that's what you need in a society, in my picture, where everybody's kind of motivated in some, not, not, not selfless, it's not altruistic, it's just part of being part of a community, is that you know you are sustained by that community. They supported you from the time you're little in various ways, not just your family, but it's a collective enterprise, and you want to give back. And you want to do so in ways that are contribute more rather than less, as long as, without sacrificing yourself in the process. Well, we have an opportunity to continue this uh, as a discussion, and we're, along with some consumption next door in the Ralph Bunch Institute Not all consumption of wine and cheese. Please join me in thanking Professor Karens for a wonderful <laughs>